thank you all for joining this um, session. So now we, we have concurring sessions in so parallel sessions. This session is the, the first one of um, the integrations and then tools. So welcome. So we have a great um, panel here with um, um, eight, nine speakers, which is good. So we have two hours. I hope that we have uh, time for questions for each presentation and at the end, some time for, for, um, for discussion. So as you know, this session is being uh, recorded. Um, try to keep uh, muted when you, you are not speaking. So at least this is important for the, the panelists. Uh, raise your hand if you want to, to, to speak. So you can put your questions in the chat, but you we can also provide you access to, to enable your microphone and you, you ask the question. So I think it's, it's, it's good. Um, uh, and then the, we can have a kind of a parallel uh, conversation in the chat. Uh, so we just have this mentioning that this is we are not taking notes from the chats. We are putting the notes in the that document that I have already shared. I will share it again for those that um, join. Um, and um, uh, so uh, this will be. Um, uh, so when we, do, we, we in the chat, I think it's good that we can also exchange some links and these kind of things that are quite useful for this particular session. So um, I'm uh, I'm Pedro Príncipe. I'm from Portugal, from the University of Minho in the north of, of Portugal. We also have a Dataverse instance for our university. Um, I'm the head of the division of the library, so uh, a specific office on... Um, uh, open science and repositories uh, and um, scientific information management. Um, and uh, I also work in several uh, European projects and uh, in a, particularly in the European um, infrastructure uh, open air. Um, and also at the national level, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing a, a, a relevant RDM initiative that we have. It's the RDM forum. Um, that we organize a meeting every year and then working groups. So, but um, I'm just the, 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 the person in charge of sharing this session. So the speakers are the important <laughs> people here. So it's a, it's a pleasure. So you see already here the, the faces, some young faces. <laughs> we are always young, forever young. <laughs> um, so um, we will have seven presentations. So uh, the idea is that we have uh, presentations from 12 to 15 minutes each, then we can have uh, two, two questions per, per, uh, per presentation. I think it's good that we do the questions just after and then at the end, maybe we will have time for more, but uh, feel free to put questions in the chat. If, if the speakers are able to reply in the chat, uh, I think it's, it's, it's good. If not, at the end, we will try to cover it, but uh, after each presentation, so we'll be able to, to present. Um, okay, so we have already a very good number. In fact, I start talking with uh, half of this, the number of participants, great. So let's talk, let's start. And, and this is really great because we have, um, we have um, uh, United States, we have uh, different places from Europe. Uh, we will start uh, with France and then go to Germany. So it's, this is really great. So that uh, Baptiste Rochelle uh, from Science Poo, um, creating a customizable open source uh, Dataverse widget for uh, website integration. So uh, I have here in my in my notes that uh, Baptiste Rochelle is a computer science engineer in Science uh, Pool, which is a really a relevant French initiative. So um, let's start with you. Uh, I will try to to remind you about the time if needed. Uh, okay. Okay. Perfect. So you can share your screen and start your presentation. Can you all see? Perfect, perfect. Okay. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, I will talk about an idea related to Dataverse that I, that I had while working at, at Sciences Po. But first, we need some context. Uh, I work in Paris at the Center for Social Political Data, which is part of uh, Sciences Po and the CNRS. Uh, at the CDSP, we used uh, Nestar for quite some time 
from uh, 2006 before migrating to Dataverse in early 2020. In the meantime, in 2017, we launched a new website for our center. We wanted our data to be more in integrated with our new websites, and we decided to create one page for each data set we hold and dis disseminate. Each page contains a description and study metadata. To navigate all this information, we developed a showcase page that is that was quite sophisticated. So I, as you can see on the screenshot, uh, there, are, there are features like a search bar and facets. This part of our website also handles translations for the facets and the pages uh, about our data sets. Uh, I think it was a good tool at that time, but I had more concerns about it when we launched our, our Dataverse instance. In fact, uh, this showcase page is not optimal and we faced some issues. The main one is that each entry is manually created and filled, so the workflow is not streamlined since we have to upload the, the data set on Dataverse and also create informative pages on our website. Uh, it, it is really time consuming. And if we ever have to change uh, some of the metadata, we have to do it in multiple places. The second problem is that the information on our website and on Dataverse is similar. So there is not much added value for duplicate work. So in general, these dataset pages are hard to maintain, and it is not uh, a motivating or re rewarding task. Uh, there are multiple solutions to this problem. Uh, one could argue that we could simply remove this feature on our website and redirect all the users to our, our Dataverse instance, which is what we are currently uh, considering. But uh, what if we want a more integrated solution that could do more? Mm, I, I was thinking of a way to automate this editorial work. So first, I wanted to create a tool that is simple to use so we can easily integrate data sets from any Dataverse instance into any web page. Since it should be possible to integrate this tool into any web page. Uh, it should also be highly customizable. Uh, we should be able to adapt the features based on the usage. Also, if you want a seamless integration, it would be nice to have a tool that follows the design language of your website. So with such a tool, we can imagine multiple use cases. For example, uh, if you are in a research center, you might want to display all your data sets with the search field on a page. Uh, and if you have a personal page, maybe you want to automatically fetch the data sets you published on Dataverse and display them on your page. Or in general, you might want to show the, the items from a collection or from a common theme. So for that, I have a prototype uh, that I will show you. Uh, so here is what it looks like uh, with default settings. This prototype provides a search engine uh, with metadata facets that you can click uh, to filter your data, data sets. Uh, for each data set, you have uh, the title, the citation, uh, description, the PID, and a link, uh, of course, a link to go to the data, data set page. Uh, the list is, so, is also paginated. There's, there are a lot of pages on, on, this, on this one. Uh, I also have a use case example that I can show you. So for example, if you are in a research center, uh, you, might you might have multiple projects, uh, like here. There's only one, but <laughs> let's imagine. Uh, and also researchers. So maybe you want to show the data set linked to the project on its page like that, but maybe without the all the search uh, 
engine, maybe you just want something simple like that. Uh, but you could also want uh, to display all your data on your home page or any page, uh, like here. So the widget can be easily integrated into a web page with some line, uh, lines of JavaScript, as you can see on the right. Most of the features are powered by the Dataverse search API. Uh, we can search, filter with facets, uh, have a pagination, uh, customize the, the number of items per page, the display order, and if the widget should only target a specific collection in Dataverse. Uh, there are also other customization options like uh, hiding the search field or facets if you, if you want a more simple look. And you can also add your own style sheet to change the appearance of the widget. But since it's still a prototype, there are some limitations and possible improvements. Uh, it doesn't support multilingualism. Uh, the, the, the interface is only in English, and the facets aren't translated. Uh, they will be displayed in the base language of your Dataverse instance. Older brow browsers might not support this widget. Uh, there are not f no fallback for older browsers yet. Uh, there are some search API parameters that are not implemented. Um, we can only display data set, not collections or file files for now. And for the look, there is only one way to display the data sets. Uh, it would be nice to have like templates to customize the, the appearance of the items you see on the list. And also, it would be nice to have a minimal uh, style sheet that is not based on Bootstrap, uh, because I used uh, Bootstrap to create this prototype. Uh, I have more improvement ideas, but these are the main ones. Uh, I haven't had a lot of feedback for on these widgets yet, but so I am unsure if it could be useful to for some of you. Uh, so do not hesitate to uh, contact me if you have any questions or feedback, or just to tell me that you like this widget uh, ID. So that's all. Thank you. Great. Uh, many thanks. Just keep this slide open just to people to check your email if they need to contact you. Yeah. Uh, any any question that you want to, or, or any comment? So you don't need to have, um, to have uh, just questions you can comment on the, on this. You have a question there in the chat about how can we get it? Uh, yeah, I can show you the link for the Git. GitHub, um, it's there. Maybe I can I can copy it to the. Uh, sorry, I can copy it to the notes. I can, I, can, I can do it. I can do it the same. Okay, thank you. There is also another another question in the in the chat. So, is the code on uh, GitHub? Yeah, everything is on GitHub. Okay. Okay. And the demo also are on GitHub, the, the two ones, this yes. one, this one, and this one, uh, this one, sorry. <laughs> I just put it in there. OK. Uh, Cherry Lake also said that, um, like the widget, how can we test it out? OK. Perfect. Um, I was just checking the questions. Philip is also highlighting something important. Maybe we should like to to it from the widget section of the of the user guide. So there is um, there is the um, the dataverse user guide where we can uh, also link it from there. So maybe we can do it. It's a good idea. Yeah. 
but it's quite uh, experimental uh, for now. Yes. So I think you, you, <laughs> keep that in mind. Feel that is useful and uh, so at least okay. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, any other comment? So I see that people are. Making comments here. And flag it experimental, yes, Philip. <laughs> okay, so let's go to the maybe we can we can move to the to the next uh, to the next presentation. Um okay, so we have um Ines and Florian uh, from the um, Jewish uh, Research Center from Germany, from Lab Notebook to Publication, a, light, a Lighthouse Workflow for Research Data. So uh, different topic. Uh, so we are uh, in this umbrella of integrations and tools. I think we have really a great session uh, to expect here. So uh, Ines and Florian, feel free to present yourself and then to give your presentation. All right. Um, yeah. So um, welcome, my name is Florian Riem and I will present uh, this topic together with Ines Schmal. We are going to talk about taking your research data from the lab notebook to a publication. I'll start this by talking about the first part, the lab notebook. Um, so like uh, Pedro just mentions, uh, we both work for the Forschungszentrum Jülich. I myself work in a team there that works um, with a vast variety of different um, institutes, instruments, experiments, and processes. So there are very different types of information that needs to be uh, kept track here. And initially, we just got the request that there would be need to be a long-term archive of sample and measurement metadata. However, as we discussed this with the uh, researchers, we basically could all agree that a long-term archival by itself isn't really all that useful. It's pretty useless if the data isn't complete, isn't reproducible, and isn't fair, um, because then you have data that can't be used and that might even be um, misleading if it isn't complete. So over time, we ended up developing an electronic lab notebook, sample to be, and the goal there was for it to be more than just an archive. So if you want to store metadata in there, you have to ask yourself, okay, what do I need to actually store? The key goals there, I think, should be definability and reproducibility. Of course, the other criteria are important, but when it comes just to Getting access to the data, you need to be sure that you actually find it and that you can then reproduce the experiments and that you have everything you need. For this, you need, of course, a lot of generic metadata. For example, things like the authors or some keywords. Those are important, but those are somewhat solved or at least a lot easier than the other half, the process-specific metadata. So for each individual instrument, you will need to keep a track of different settings and you might need uh, to keep track of envir environmental parameters like the temperature and humidity for some uh, experiments while they might not be important for others. So the challenge here is how can we store this flexible process specific metadata? And there's two ways that um, people like to uh, go about this. The first is to say, okay, we'll do just like we've always done. We'll write down what we did. And this is very flexible and comfortable, but the downsides are plenty because this is just text. So there might be some quantities in there, but they're just text. So it's hardly machine readable. And as a result, it's barely searchable. You cannot search for um, something uh, with a parameter in a specific range because you have to search for the exact text here. As a result, also there's no validation. So if you make a mistake like was done here in the screenshot, that's it. The other extreme would be to have a form for each and every individual process. And this way you can then fill out these fields. 
these can have different uh, data types like uh, the text field, of course, but you can also reference other objects, enter uh, date times and so on. And this has the benefit that it is machine readable and you can actually search based on these fields and on these metadata attributes. This then makes validation possible. And this all seems really great, except that this would require some setup for each individual process. So we decided, okay, we should do something in this direction, but we need to make it in a way that allows to minimize this setup and uh, that allows us to, for example, do this without having to restart the application. And this here you can see it's a pretty easy decision to not go with just the risk text format, but to go um, with something more. And the way we did this is with uh, schemas. These are similar to the Dataverse metadata blocks in some ways, but um, they are really quite dynamic because it's a domain specific language for formats, um, which is based on JSON as a carrier language. This defines all the metadata fields and um, you can be as generic or specific as desired. So you can just say, I want a name and I want a description, which should be um, markdown or you can add all these individual fields that you need for this process. This allows us to have a clear separation between formats and code. And for example, you can have things like a graphical editor for the basic schemas. Um, so users can pretty much define themselves what they need to keep track of. Um, and to be honest, the instrument scientists usually know best what they need to keep track of, not uh, me as a software developer. So, with this approach, we can handle this process specific metadata, the flexible metadata. It can be entered, stored, and found. Um, what this looks like here is uh, for an example. We want to uh, enter information about an x ray um, experiment. We need to just give it a name, tell the system which sample we used, and um, enter the measurement numbers. And then we basically have this very simple data set, which will be augmented automatically by a script uh, using these me measurement numbers to gather all the um, metadata for this experiment um, and enter it into this. But now that we have all this flexible metadata for this experiment, the question is, how can we publish it? Because sample we cannot handle that. And for this, um, Ines is gonna continue with the second part. So can I start? Ah, okay. Yeah. So you can see now the full perfect, screen. Perfect. perfect. Uh, yes, okay. Then I will go on now with the second part of this talk and I will start first with an overview about Jülich Data and the Forschungszentrum Jülich. So Jülich Data, this is our institutional data repository here. And the main purpose is to index all data publications which are created at or in the context of the Forschungszentrum Jülich. And it's managed by the Central Library and this is where I work in the team research data. Um, the Forschungszentrum Jülich have three main research areas. This is energy with topics like renewable energy and climate research, information which include, it includes neurosciences, supercomputing simulations, and last bioeconomy with topics like biotechnology and plant sciences. And it's organized in 10 institutes and those 10 institutes are then subdivided into 80 institutes departments. So this means we have here now, um, the Forschungszentrum Jülich is very heterogeneous. It has a wide range of different research topics and workflows. And this all had to be taken into account when Jülich data was implemented. So the organization of Jülich data starts with a root collection at the top. And then in this root collection, there are the Dataverse collections of the institute departments. And then in each um, institute department's collection, there are sub-collections for projects, researchers, and so on, and the data sets. And it's so that um, each institute is now free to organize it according to its needs. And additional the rule of the decentralized data manager was implemented. So the DDM is, um, acts as a contact person for external requests. And at the same time, the DDM supports institutional staff with the data management. And also uh, the DDM is the admin of the Dataverse collection 
of the Institute's department. So the DDM is the one who grants access permissions to users, supports the staff with Jewish data, and mainly um, he will be the one who creates and publishes data sets. So a standard publication workflow in Jewish data starts with the researcher creating a data set. Then the researcher can edit the data set and finally it can be submitted for refer to the DDM. Then the DDM creates the data set and decides if it can be published or it has to be returned back to the author. So every data set is provided with metadata and Jülich data um, provides uh, several metadata schemes. So there are two mandatory ones, citation metadata, and then a special metadata uh, schema was developed for the Forschungszentrum Jülich. And then the optional ones, this, uh, those are subject specific metadata schemes like geospatial metadata and new EngMeta. So EngMeta was developed for the engineering disciplines and it's based on already existing standards like data site, code meta and so on. And in the, in the Dataverse software, it was implemented in two blocks, engineering metadata and process metadata. And in EngMeta, every data set is described by a descriptive metadata like title, author, description. Then there are subject specific metadata like variables, components, parameters. Then there are metadata for the process, which describe instruments, methods, softwares, and last, there are technical metadata for file size, file format, checksum. So in, process meta, in the process metadata block, um, a method can be described by parameters. And the implementation in Jülich data, it was implemented in Jülich data by using five parameters. So one for name, one for the textual value, one for the numerical value, and the unit and sample. So now I want to show you an example how the metadata from the sample DB are mapped to the metadata in Jülich data. And first I start here with the, with the field measurement name. So here measurement name is mapped to Jülich data to the parameter name. And the entry demo measurement, it's mapped to the parameter texture value. So the second example here, detector distance is mapped to name. And here the entry consists of a of number and a unit. So we need in Jülich data two parameters. So one here for the parameter for the numerical value and for the unit. So the workflow starts in the sample DB. Here a new button was implemented, export to Jülich data. And if a researcher clicks on this button, then um, it's possible to, se to select the metadata which should be exported and to select the Dataverse collection. And then the data set is automatically created in Jülich data. And from this point on, it's, um, this workflow is similar to the standard publication workflow. So the researcher can edit the data set. Uh, it can be sent uh, to the DDM for this uh, submit for review button. Then the DDM creates the data set, and finally it can be published. So now I'm coming to the end of my talk, and here I want to show both work workflows in comparison. So the first is a standard publication workflow, which starts in Jülich data, and now the new workflow, this starts in the sample DB. And here the researcher can select the metadata, which should be exported, and the data set is then automatically created in Jülich data. And here, so the advantage is that the researcher saves time and it makes it easier to publish the data. So at this point, I want to say thank you for your attention. Great. So really great um, so use case integration that you shared with, with us. Thank you very much. So. Thank you, Florian and Ines. Um, uh, already some applause here in the chat. Let's see if there are um, um, <clears throat> questions or comments. Feel free also if you want to comment something with your microphone to raise your hand. We can give you permissions to share. Um, Philip, um, very, very cool. Smart to use that method parameter field that allows multiple values. Um, is this schema also open for public? Uh, Lincoln is asking. I don't know if 
Florian, um, you can reply. Yes, maybe I can answer. So this uh, schema was uh, developed especially for the portion Centrum Munich. So I'm not really sure if um, it would make sense. So if I really can reuse it. So at this point, um, because it's um, uh, uh, my colleague also, uh, Oliver Berto, he also works in the Central Library. He is here too, and he just uh, posted a link. Okay. Yes, thank you, Oliver. So the link is here. So. Any other comment? So do you, you have a, a, a simple uh, integration and in work be between um, uh, Florian as a developer and the, and the library as a, a service provider in the research center? How it was? Everything, it went everything good? It was a, a good collaboration? Uh, yes, I can say yes. <laughs> <laughs> I would say so as well. <laughs> Perfect. Yes, this kind of integrations with the um, with the electronic lab notebooks are really critical and important is something that for sure several institutions like like your research center is is trying to to find good solutions and easy ways to 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 do this smooth integration it's it, it's hard because the the diversity of tools is is, is for for really the level, electronic lab notebooks is is, is a lot yes to address the question from um, Philip Durbin, um, the export from sample B to um, yeah, it, uh, it's done in Python, but it just uses the API for creating entries in uh, Dataverse. So it um, even if you don't go straight from the code there, it should be fairly doable to uh, do this for other lab notebooks that uh, might want to export this. Yes, Jim, please. There are also another question, I think. But Jim, can you? Thanks. Can... Yeah, I, I just wanted to ask about. So, so one one of the concerns I have whenever whenever somebody's trying to send stuff from another application is that users can then, you know, edit the metadata in the application in a way that's not consistent with the original one. So, do do you have those kinds of concerns that that further editing you know, could change the change. Are you trying to go back to, to your sample DB at all and, and worried about that backwards compatibility if, if somebody can edit in the user interface in Dataverse? So um, from my side in sample DB, while you can edit data to, for example, fix um, typos, it's not really something you would do a long time after the fact. You might add information about publications that were uh, that use this object and things like that. But for the main metadata, once it gets published, it shouldn't really be in a point where it would need regular changing or where it would need changing uh, at all, unless it was some typo that you only realized far too late. In that case, I would expect that um, the researchers would, when they realize this, try and fix it in both cases. But I don't think that's a really common occurrence. OK, thanks. OK. OK, I think. Um... There are several, the links are here. So checking no more questions, uh, anyone? Any other questions? I think this is this is something that I think we as community should, should uh, start sharing more information around these implementations. We are doing this right now, but uh, for electronic lab notebooks, I'm, I'm not sure if it is my, my case for my university that we were finding a solution for us that we can link to Dataverse. So this is why I'm paying more attention to this one. <laughs> okay, many thanks Florian and Ines. Great presentation. Thank you for your contribution. Um, so let's, uh, let's move. 
to the um, to the other um, presentation. Um, So we can have now the third presentation, just for you to put here the agenda. So we have some more people that have joined. So we already covered the first one from, from Science Poo, Baptiste Rochelle, and now Inez and Florian. Now we go to uh, Dan from Storch. He's the, uh, a developer um, in Storch. I don't know how, how, if I spell it well, maybe not. Uh, using an alternative to a three connecting dataverse to storage. Let's see if uh, um, we can have your presentation then. Yes, you can All present right. yourself and then and, and give the presentation. Many thanks for this contribution. Yeah, can, can you hear me okay? Perfect, and the slides are okay, yes, everything okay. All right, um, as mentioned, uh, connecting Dataverse to storage, which is an alternative to S3. Uh, as mentioned, my background is in software. I graduated from the University of Utah um, in computer engineering, but uh, the only reason I chose that degree is because I thought it sounded cooler than computer science, but I've, I've done seven plus years just in software at various companies. Um, one of which is in structure who makes Canvas, which some universities may use as their learning management system. Um, I've had six plus years in distributed network storage. So I find uh, really, I found the cheesiest joke that possible. Um, it says I, I started a band called 99 megabytes. We haven't got a gig yet. I, I find those funny because I've been in it so long. Uh, so I'm going to go over some of the types of <laughs> some of the types of data storage, um, what what storage is, how to connect it to Dataverse, and some customer highlights. So basically, you can have on-prem or have um, your data in the cloud. There's different types of tiers in the cloud, which I I want to go into. So the on-prem solution is like a NAS device or a high-performance computer. You'll have the fastest speeds here. It's costly to get the infrastructure up front. And then you have the ongoing costs of maintenance and upgrades and, and paying your staff. And, and the risky part of this is that you only have one copy of your data. Uh, moving it to the cloud, you can use Backblaze and Wasabi, rent hard drives from them. They use RAID technology to duplicate your data so that one of these hard drives could fail, they could still um, save it. It's on the cheaper end, um, but they have minimum storage. And they say that their egress is fee, but um, it's linked with a fair use policy. So like if you use, if you download the file more than twice in a month, let's say, then they'll, they'll tack on a fee. And then probably the most familiar is Amazon S3. What they do is they duplicate your data within a region. So like they'll have three copies of your data in Virginia. And that's what most people pay for in order to reduce. Um, yeah, and what, what some people don't know is they also have a, like an API request fee. In order to cut down on costs, uh, there's a lot of um, data sets that people need to store. They opt in for like a Glacier tier on S3, which is nice for archival if you'll never touch it. But what most people I've talked to over the years, they don't realize that the retrieval fees often add up to be more than just the standard tier if you're accessing that da data frequently. And then at the top of the storage tier, Amazon offers a multi-region. So they'll copy your data to like say Oregon. So you could have your data in um, Virginia, Oregon, or, or maybe in Europe. And, and this is the highest tier you'll pay almost $50 per terabyte and, and the same in egress as um, a single region. Uh, the, 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 the biggest pro for this is that your data is very durable and there's a high low chance that you'll lose it. And then the final option I wanted to go over is the de decentralized model. And so in this model, what your, your data is broken up into several pieces and stored on separate continents, such as the US, Europe, and Asia. Um, there, there's no API 
API request fees and it's open source. And the model that we use at storage, it's more environmentally friendly because we encourage people with um, existing unutilized hard drive space to join our network and offer it to be used. So here's a table of summary of the pros and cons of each approach. Um, uh, basically, you know, it starts cheap, more expensive, more expensive, and then the decentralized model offers uh, some of the pros of all of those. So what is storage? Um, it's the multi-regional um, storage option that the highest tier of Amazon. Uh, you'll find the performance availability and durability is similar to S3. And we also focus on privacy and security. How it works is we have our software that's open source. Anyone can join the network if they have free hard drive space. And we compensate them fairly for the data that's stored on their drives. And then using our client side applications like the AWS CLI or our up, up, sorry, our uplink. Um, that data is then dispersed throughout our distributed network. Then our satellites manage payments and the user interface. So when a file is uploaded, this is uh, a sample of what a 4K video uploaded to the network looks like. All of these nodes store pieces of those files and it's distributed in a way that we can lose up to 50 of the pieces and only need 29 to retrieve the the file. Um, I would I would show an example of the 4K video streaming if we have time, but the the link there is on the left. And so, how to integrate it with DataVerse uh, using the S3 compatible API? It just works by default, and I'll go into that in a little bit. You'll get the server side encryption by default, and it works with familiar tools like uh, the Python S3 API SDKs. And then talking with Jim Myers a little bit, uh, there he ex expressed that there's some interest to have further encrypted encryption of your data. And so if you use our client, uh, you can have end-to-end -end, end -end encryption. So we won't know anything about your files, only you do. You control the keys to that, and that provides the maximum privacy. So just going over the integration guide real quick. Uh, you'll set up an account on storage. Uh, once you get there, you'll generate an access token, create S3 credentials. Uh, on your data, uh, Dataverse server, you'll type AWS configure, type that access key, secret key, or edit the AWS config file directly. Once that's set up, you can create your S3 bucket to store all your files and then configure your server to have an alternative storage type. And that's a bunch of JVM options as shown here. And once that's set up, uh, when you create a new Dataverse, uh, you can select the storage option. And that provides a nice way to slowly migrate your data over time. All right, uh, let's go into some customer highlights. Um, so Jim Myers has been testing storage over the last few months. He, uh, he ran a test of 101 gigabyte files and found they were uploaded successfully, also tested 60 gigabyte files. And he said the upload and download speeds were reasonable. And he's working towards moving some of the QDR um, data into storage. He also said, I test how long to get a previewer for a picture and video to the display and be ready to start. Latency was similar to S3 and not noticeable. Last year, Simit shared how they had switched some of their things to storage, and this is just a one-year update. And so they found that there's no behavioral differences from their production environment, and they plan next month once they upload, once they update Dataverse to 5.10, that um, they'll start using storage as the default. And then 
Um, some other use cases they found this past year is they replaced Dropbox and SharePoint as a file sharing tool for their scientists. And they also run a cron job using R clone to back up their CCTV recordings in their AWS servers and uh, having great cost savings there for their university. Uh, Luke um, is a postdoctorate fellow at NASA on Goddard Institute, and he does research on the ocean carbon cycle to quantify whether the goals of the Paris Agreement are being met. And so he shares resources of a high performance computer and has tons of client data in the .NET CDF format. And the, the resources are limited on that computer so that um, they have to um, download and upload, and he, and he found that it was easy to do with storage. And then he shared a story of how the, the lo local storage failed on the HPC and some research data was lost. And so it's always the, the, the best time to have a backup is when you actually need it. And then finally, the University of Edinburgh, they have um, a Tesseract supercomputer in many regions like in Europe. And um, Dr. Antonin did an independent um, performance test of storage. Uh, he found that the upload from Edinburgh was at, um, on average 5,200 gigabits once chunked. And he goes into detail what chunk meant in his report. And then to deliver the, the data across continents, he um, recorded the, the rates that he got. And here you can see that it was from Berkeley to Boston, to Texas, to the University of Edinburgh. And he independ independently verified where the, the chunks of his data were stored. And you can see it's across the entire globe. So that's it. Uh, the integration guide there, I think was linked in the chat. And you, there's the link to last year where uh, we went in depth on some of more of the use cases and feel free to always send me an email. And thanks. If you want, you can uh, you can put the video if you think that uh, so you have some time. Feel free, or we can. Oh yeah. Get the sure. comments. Let me you are using the the time in the right way, so you can you can. Yeah, let's see for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Not sure if my upload will. So there is an a little bit of latency starting it up, but once it's loaded, it will stream just fine. This is a serving the video mm -hmm. in 4K, and you see that it's already made a, a nice buffer there. And the pieces on the the right side over here, you can see that it's being pulled from all across the world. And you can also seek in the file or in the video. And um, so Luke, Luke stated how the, the dot czar format of the, is a new uh, streamable format of .NET CDF, which makes it um, easier to consume. And um, found that uh, it worked just fine on storage. Uh, let's see. It looks like there's okay, some yeah, questions. We can, I think the idea is, is here. I think we can follow. Okay, then. Many thanks. Um, yeah, I'll answer the questions in the chat. Yes, there are already okay. comments and, uh, and at least a request, I think, from Philip. Philip uh, Durbin always from Dataverse, always quite active here. Uh, saying that uh, so it's uh, properly listed in the guides of Dataverse, but it will be good to update a uh, link to um, this docs here. So please check this comment. And okay. Slava is also saying that they have tried in the advanced grid storage layer. Um, José Carvalho, 
uh, would it be possible to change storage provider, for example, from storage to AWS and or Perm? Do you expect any constraints on this operation? Um, so the Dataverse, I believe you can change the storage layer when you create a new one. Migrating yeah. from one to the other would be something Jim could could answer to probably. Um, yeah, but we, we, we do. We, do you, oh, do you want me to just take that quick? Um, so so at QDR, we're looking at that. The, the main driver for QDR was to kind of get uh, some bigger data sets than than what they've handled so far, and so looking for cheaper storage along with the, the potential for the encryption. Um, but we've also considered whether we're going to move the existing storage over and, and essentially we can create a new store um, and the back end work is essentially you have to sync your your old bucket at AWS over to storage A and then there is a database operation. Essentially the all of the storage items in the database start with the name of the store. So if you move them from an Amazon S3 store to a store J store, you, you swap that prefix on all of the files that you just changed over and Dataverse will understand that they're in the new place and it'll work just fine. So um, it's a relatively lightweight thing, but it's not completely automated to move things between two stores at this point. Awesome. And then the other question was, what if the storage servers are down? So it's a decentralized network. Yes. So the, the satellites are redundant, but the, all the independent node operators would you'd still be able to retrieve those files with the client side code. So yes. If feel free to to turn on your uh, microphone and ask the question. Yeah. So the, my question about the redundancy is uh, how much redundancy you you have in order to ensure that uh, the quality of the file will be enough. Yeah. So when a file is uploaded to the storage network, we use erasure encoding, <clears throat> and it's so uh, we upload eighty pieces into the network. And we 80. only need to, yeah, 80. And we only need 29 of those pieces to restore the file. And we also monitor those pieces. So if like, say it gets down to 50, we'll repair the file. And so that the redundancy is back in the network. Okay. Then many things. There are some comments Just, in the chat. So we... Pedro, may yeah. I ask another question? So from your map, it was clear that uh, Mostly the servers, the store servers are in US or in Europe. Would it be possible to, to provide the support, financial support for people who accept to provide storage such that, for example, Africa can develop? Yeah, so it's concentrated in those areas um, just because that's. Uh, where most of the interest is. Um, but uh, we do have a, a lot of nodes in Asia. For that particular study, I don't think the data was there um, because of the locations which were uploaded. And so uh, when it's uploaded, it will choose the fastest responding operators. And so it tends to be located closely to where it's uploaded. Okay, because it's not necessarily a problem of uh, of fa being fast. It could be uh, interesting for people just to help to develop uh, countries in development. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so we have um, geo location. Um, could, so so you can specify where you want the file to go, and so it would go to a certain region. Great many things. It, then, if you can reply to some of the comments uh, or to some yeah, absolutely yeah, yeah comments I don't want in the chat, please time. feel feel free. Yes, great many Thank things. Thank you so much. This presentation. Let's move to the to this joint venture. So from here in Slava. Um, so um, <clears throat> uh, uh, if it, so, we have a joint venture between. Uh, yeah, I will show my uh, screen. Netherlands and France, uh, University of Paris. 
so Yves professor in data science at the Faculty of Pharmacy of University of um, Paris Cité. And Slava, uh, we, it's uh, our friend here in, in Dataverse, is a senior information and data scientist at, at DANS and um, data archiving and network services from, from, from the Netherlands. So um, let's stop this. You know we'll speak. So I think it's, it's I'm not sure if it's just you, Eve, or if you both do the presentation. Uh, we will do both a presentation, but I will start. Uh, so just. Uh... I will start with the. I have changed slightly the, the title. Um, up, do you see the slide? Before. Before it was no. better? Yes. <laughs> Before like it this? was working. Now it. Okay, so let's start like this. Let's make it like this. So I will introduce the COVID-19 museum, and I think uh, it can be a use case for the Dataverse community. So what is the COVID-19 Museum? We want to unite in an open way the collection of digital trace related to the pandemic to offer the possibility of analyzing this trace in a reproducible way, and we will see why, and to protect the knowledge that will uh, be extracted out of it. So just before to start the talk, I will stop uh, the sharing of the screen and share something else which is this little video. And this little video is just to show you which type of data we are thinking about. So this one, our children from Denag concert who are playing at home during the pandemic. Why I show this? It's just in order to let you understand that what we are looking for uh, all type of data. So I will stop in order to and you need to stop in your side of the music as well. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. <laughs> yeah, here it is. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so great, great, great. What I want to show is really the diversity of the data we are looking for. And uh, it's far away from epidemiologic data, it's far away from uh, death cases or whatever, or contaminated people. It's about what has happened during the pandemic. So let's start. Why? The idea is to build a didactic, analytic, and memory tool to follow and understand the impact of COVID-19 on our society, to build the infrastructure of a collective memory and help the aging of a new social model, perhaps more resilient, perhaps more altruist, in order to protect the society in the future. How? By unifying the collection of numerical artifacts in a collaborative way, and I think you know exactly what is it, so I will not speak about this, enriched from uh, simple metadata, provide access to this database for everyone, and on request for research and the database access website, et cetera, will follow open science principle. Okay, we have crossed the first pandemic of the digital age. And for the first time through the digital material produced, it, was, it is possible, sorry, to follow, understand and compare within each country the evolution of this emerging disease, the social reaction, and the individual, political, medical reaction, everything. What you have seen on a daily basis, you have seen drawings, humor, video, songs on every social network. We have seen a lot of research made, a lot of interviews, a lot of texts arriving, and all these are collective testimonies. Also, naturally, we have all this administrative, legal, and technical document that we have received on our head, at least for all people uh, linked to type of institution. And uh, okay, so unify the collection of digital artifact in the database, develop the participatory with the public support, and offer access to all these objects. This is the Electronic Museum. On 
uh, on the top of this iceberg, you, uh, you will have just a website for consultation, for search and knowledge extraction. So something very simple that we are uh, used to imagine. Okay. What is the interest? The interest is to cover cultural education and research aspect. So we will develop a tool for storage, for preservation, but also for classification and filling. It will be a didactic tool. It is this museum that we have visiting with our teacher when we were young. So you have a teacher who explain you, you can see this, you can see that related to this period, explaining what was the player. But it could be also an analytical tool accessible for researchers, either in social science, self science, or digital science, any researchers. So what we have seen, we have seen some changes in behavior. We have seen plenty of new response to this pandemic. New response meaning new opportunity, such that we could compare from country to country, from region to region, what was the difference in the reaction. Also, we can synchronize this comparison because we have a beginning of the lockdown, first lockdown, end of the first lockdown, et cetera, et cetera. So there is an interest to provide this idea. So now the question is how we can build a such COVID-19 museum. And the COVID-19 museum is something like this. You have a COVID-19 museum who developed a software, software which can be installed either on collection, such that this collection are connected to the COVID-19 museum, or it can be installed on computing resources, such that these computing resources will provide a part of their potential to help researchers to look inside the COVID-19 museum. And they can naturally be installed on computer of a researcher just in order that the researcher can ask a query in order to, uh, to look inside the COVID-19 museum. Okay, just a simple example first. I call it memory pedagogy and analytic. It's just to recall you that uh, the lockdown for four to five years a child has represented almost 10% of his life. So let's imagine that during the lockdown, some child has, uh, some children has made some drawings and that parents or grandparents drop these drawings into the COVID-19 museum. So, the drawings form a memorial corpus. This is what you stored inside the museum. The symbolism of the drawing explains a posteriori the feeling of the children. This is what you do with a teacher when you visit the, the museum. And now A for analytical. You can extract from this drawing the pattern which are either normal pattern, normal meaning common pattern, or exceptional pattern, meaning outliers pattern. You can go to a behavior science uh, specialist in order to ask, please, could you explain to us what are these type of exceptional pattern? You can make statistics later when the children is back in school. You can make statistics just by asking to a child, please, could you draw a picture from this period, and then to connect to what is inside the COVID-19 museum. And naturally, at the end of the end, you can imagine to find some fragile children with respect to this period, fragile in the sense, fragilized by the lockdown and probably to help them. Okay, just to go faster, just we can, I have several examples of uh, questionings. Caregiver facing the pandemic, teaching in lockdown, which actor to ensure continuity in lockdown. I recall you that you have had electricity, you have had the internet. They were not arriving like this by magic. 
there were workers behind, and this is why you have been able to continue to work. Evolution of the cities, I'm in Paris, and I can promise you that the Paris has completely changed. More backline, more terrace, et cetera, et cetera. And naturally the question, lockdown or not lockdown, an international experience. So I uh, don't want to go too much, but actually we are building a project in France about patrimonializing the French health system reaction during the COVID-19 museum. And we are asked to bring this project at the European level. People who will be connected to us, they are welcome to send uh, an email. So just to go further, open science, reproducible research, tag partic uh, participatory keyword will be include data science. We want to have all the project of data science open project embedded directly inside the COVID-19 museum, probably the need of a blockchain in order to respect uh, privacy, supervised learning, what will allow the COVID-19 museum is to build the link between the digital artifacts and uh, their, the object themselves. International, the museum is intended to be duplicated in its whole structure at the international because it's a distributed uh, museum. So to summarize, the COVID-19 museum is a tool of analyzing at the service of human society, respectful of the actor who constitute it. It is involved in the unification in an open way of a collection of digital artifacts related to the pandemic. It provides the opportunity to analyze this trace in a reproducible way. It create the link between the ontology of the collection, because as each actor can have a different ontology, we will have to build a meta ontology. This is really a problem, or not a problem, but a, a research case. Uh, it will protect the knowledge inside directly the COVID-19 museum in order to respect reproducible research, or whether it maintains the museography of each actor. It does not organize collection, does not analyze the collection, and in this sense, will not be judge and jury. Now I will uh, give uh, to Just Slava. pay attention to the, to the time, okay, to the duration. Yeah. Slava, Slava, if you want to continue quickly. Yeah, I will try to do it quickly. So now, um, yeah, uh, just uh, half of hour ago, I did a presentation on archive in the box that we built uh, um, in, in shock project, which is a European project. So we are using um, EOS compliant services. And uh, now this is perfect use case, COVID-19 museum. And uh, there is also uh, uh, um, implementation of um, some demonstration that uh, we wanted to share with you. So it's just data force, and in data force, we're collecting different kinds of objects, some visual objects, and uh, we started to collect data sets. We, basically, any kind of COVID-related information could be deposited in data wars, and we're using artificial intelligence and machine learning to do name entity recognition, for example. So this is a uh, first application that uh, we created, and uh, this is timeline connected to data wars. And uh, we started to harvest news uh, in French, in Dutch, and in other lang languages. And uh, we're basically doing processing of media streams and uh, collecting news and extracting information about uh, COVID. And now it's visually placed on this nice timeline. So you can basically go back in time, like in museum, and you can see what was the uh, situation in specific day, what uh, was discussed, what, 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 what was discussion, and uh, how people saw that, and you can also see screenshots of uh, newspapers at that time. And uh, this is next demonstrator. You've just mentioned about uh, uh, drawings of uh, children. So we also created a prototype that uh, allows to upload uh, drawings. And uh, we hope that people will start to use it and will start to create own memory. And everything will go and will, uh, will be archived in Dataverse. And uh, yeah, last slide. Last slide. 
<laughs> so nice. I, I can actually show uh, this timeline working, but, but I think I don't have time anymore, right? It's I can uh, stop uh, sharing if you want. Yeah, so Pedro, do, Pedro, Pedro we, do we have time or not? One minute, one minute and 10 seconds. <laughs> okay, I will try to be quick. Uh, let me quickly share it and you will understand what I mean. So this is our Dataverse instance and uh, this is how it works. So basically these are events that we're collecting and you're able just switch between newspapers and browse. You can also search in the content and uh, we do name entity recognition, like I said. So basically uh, we are building real museum, but it's virtual and hopefully after some time, we should be able to connect uh, virtual reality uh, hands, headsets and you should be able to see it uh, um, just using virtual reality. So that's a kind of project that we are building. So if you are interested, just, just contact us and uh, there is a lot of interest from different people and just you're welcome to, to contact us and to collaborate with us. Thanks a lot. Okay. Many things. <laughs> so, if you want to join, there is this uh, two address: contact at uh, covid19.museum and uh, dataverse at uh, covid19.museum. So that uh, you can uh, join us. It's an open project, and uh, we will be really glad to have you. Yeah, and uh, what I forgot to mention, everything that we'll create uh, in this project will share this Dataverse community. So this uh, timeline uh, explore, I really believe that that that's something uh, must have for museums. So it will be all, all also published as uh, uh, this open source uh, license on GitHub and will be shared, and hopefully it will be supported by global Dataverse community consortium. Right, right Jim? <laughs> Slava always pushing <laughs> for the community. Thanks. 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 Great implementation. So, um, so if there are comments, you can. I think you can reply, um, even and, and, and Slava, and then maybe if we have time at the end. Okay. Um, let's go to the to the next uh, presentation. Uh, so, uh, let's go to Austria into the um, by dataverse do, doing tests data migrations and other api stuff by stefan kasberger from the, the Aust austrian uh, social science data archive um let me check ah, okay you are here okay <laughs> yes my microphone microphone Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, how it Thank works. You, okay. Uh, hi, um, I'm Stefan. I'm the DevOps engineer uh, and uh, Python developer at Austria, the Austrian Social Science Data Archive. Uh, I'm now back from my one year parental leave uh, and I'm the lead developer from PyDataverse. So that's why I, I want to present some stuff I did in the last two years. Uh, around PyDataverse and some other uh, tools using it. So. Oh, that's very slow. Uh, okay, yeah. So first, uh, PyDataverse is an open source um, Python module which should help you with Dataverse. Um, it helps you with doing API requests, but also to work with the data, data and the metadata itself. And the core idea was to build uh, it for data migrations and also to do automation and testing and use it in microservice and also do data science with it. It's all open source, it's um, tested and documented on and you can find it on the GDCC GitHub page. And it was funded uh, so far from Oster and from Shock. 
So uh, the core modules is an API module and then a data module to help it transform data from different formats to different formats and some help performance. And uh, in the last year, I also worked on a new feature branch uh, to implement async await functionality for the API request, which already runs. So if someone's interested, uh, you can have a look at it um, on GitHub. And it's already quite a lot used by different organizations for different purposes. Uh, some uh, I've listed up here, like the OpenDP project, or Corona Y, and all kind of different data migration projects. And data migrations is one of the central use cases. Uh, and it uses different input formats. Uh, and I've done a migration from a Nesta server to Dataverse, one from the GSSD D space data format, but also from a paper digitization project into uh, Dataverse. Uh, and so far, uh, at least I can say there were more than 100,000 uh, data objects transferred uh, with the help of PyDataverse so far. Um, and I just started um, three years ago with this project, one year now we're gone, um, and now starting uh, again a bit. Uh, and another use case is to do data science, so you can access a Dataverse instance imported in this case to your pandas uh, data frame and then do some data science stuff with it. Um, so right into the development of Dataverse, um, the idea came up to use, uh, to, to pie Dataverse, the idea came up to use it for automation and for testing purposes. And that's when I started the development of Dataverse tests. Uh, and the idea was to develop a tool which helps you for the operation, to test the operational requirements of a Dataverse installation. So it's directed over towards data, uh, uh, DevOps or sysadmins. Uh, and it's based upon PyDataverse, and it's also using Selenium for front-end testing. Uh, Dance uses it already for the uh, uh, very nice Dataverse pipeline they uh, are developing. And the first release is coming up uh, tomorrow, uh, the 0 0.1.0 of Dataverse tests, uh, because I've done some uh, finishing work the last days. Um, and it consists of two parts. The first one is tests. So you have some basic tests, but you also have some more um, uh, complex ones like the data completeness, where you can check, for example, after an upgrade or after a migration, if still all data is in there, which you expect to be. Uh, and also the authentication, for example, where you can test on the front end if your normal login functionality or also your shibboleth login functionality works. Um, yeah, and some others. And the second part is the UTILS. It's like helping help, helper functions. Uh, it's a command line integration, and it uh, helps you to create test data, to remove them the data, to collect data from certain installations. This is, for example, used to collect all the information from one Dataverse installation which then needs to be used to verify if your data is complete in the testing. So if you switch from one storage to another, you then can uh, still uh, do it automatically, which after like 100 data set, it's, it's way more fun to do it automatically than uh, by hand. Um, yeah, so that was the basic idea. And I want to give you a short demo of two of the main use cases. So you should see now the terminal. Um, perfect, and perfect. Uh, at the beginning, I just set up, uh, set some uh, variables for the setup to do the front end test. And now you will see how the authentication with a shibboleth user looks like in this case. So uh, Dataverse test is uh, developed with PyTest. Uh, then you have to define the uh, browser engine. And then you just call the the file and the test itself. And when you ex when, when it's executed, then the browser window pops up, does what I told the, the, the script to do, and then checks if everything's done right. So here, the cookie button is pressed, then the login page is visited. We then have a shibboleth 
uh, um, integration for the University of Vienna. It gets, um, it, it works. And at the end, you see that the user was logged in. So all the uh, verification was done properly. So the test passed. Uh, and the second use case uh, I want to show is uh, the UTILS functionality. And that's the workflow I normally use for DevOps activities for testing purposes and for uh, when I do an upgrade or stuff like this. So you see here an empty Dataverse installation on my local host on my PC. Uh, and here you see a JSON file where I configured different uh, um, steps of activities. Uh, so the first one is an uh, action, uh, the create action for a Dataverse instance. You define, for example, uh, uh, the user handle, so it's uh, uploaded by the Dataverse admin user. He defined a metadata file, uh, and then another step comes, which in this case, the next one is to publish uh, the already created one, uh, and then I do it with another uh, Dataverse. And here you create a data set. Uh, also upload the metadata for this data set. Uh, and then on the next step, uh, I want to add a data file to this data set. Um, so you also have this create step uh, defined in here. Um, it's, it's very uh, small the definition and it's uh, uh, repeating quite often. And at the end, I just want to publish the data set I created above. Uh, so all is accessible uh, in public. Um, so um, now go back to, um, to the terminal. So I created now uh, so so that, that, that I created now the JSON config file and now I want to do the uploading so I call the create test data comment and I just have to pass the file name of the JSON file I've shown you uh, and then execute it and you see data was created uh, data was published data set created um, and now some file uploading is done, which you don't see. And then it gets published and the whole process uh, is finished. And when I go back now, you will see the uh, created data from uh, the comments I, from the comment I execute. And in here, for example, you see some exemplatory data words and data sets. Uh, this, for example, uses the full metadata data set and here are the files attached and you also see the metadata with the um, um, standard, uh, standardized uh, metadata set. So uh, the next step is now to use the collect metadata, uh, collect data function. So I call the collect function of the uh, Dataverse test uh, module and I just define the, the Dataverse uh, where to start the collection. Uh, so it's the top node of the Dataverse data tree and then to output everything as JSON. And this is then stored locally inside your project where you are right now. And you see on my localhost um, folder, there is a set of data. You can see here now the data set idea and also the PID and here the Dataverse ID and the alias of the Dataverse created. This can then be used to verify with the tests if data is still there or for whatever purpose you want. So this is very universally. And uh, to finish a usual uh, testing uh, activity, you quite often want to clean up at the end. So then I normally call the remove, remove test data function you pass the user uh, and you, you pass the Dataverse to start cleaning up from, so the top node, and also define that the top node itself should be uh, deleted and that what has been done. So if I refresh now, the Dataverse I created is already gone and the installation is empty again. So that's the use case. Um, and, oh, wait. No, there we are. So, and 
in this uh, repository, I also used another project I started for this. It's a data that the project data was test data, which should serve as kind of like a gold standard for metadata, which can be used for testing or what other activity you have in mind. But it's just like a very uh, exemplary high quality set of metadata for the data was data types. It's also on GitHub. And the last point here is uh, that it's an open source project. It's a, it's, most parts are on the GDCC GitHub page. Uh, and the next Dataverse release is, um, I'm already in the middle of it. It's 50% finished. It uh, includes uh, the updates to new APIs and some additional API stuff and also improve the testing. So, so it can be more sustainable on the long run. Uh, and also there are many feature requests I get, which uh, would be great to have in the tool, like the direct upload functionality, uh, adding new APIs, and especially I think to have custom uh, metadata support for all kinds of metadata structures. But there is a but uh, uh, in this uh, uh, whole idea thing. The first one is uh, the funding through the shock project ended with the end of the shock project. And also we at Auster did all our data migration activities, so no more funding from Auster and Shock. And I'm also leaving next month Auster, so um, my future is not uh, um, at Auster anymore. And I, as a lead developer, uh, am not planning to work on that. So I think one very good thing to uh, take home from this is like open source means community. So I think this is a very important uh, message now that uh, PyDataverse is used, but it needs a more sustainable structure. And I think GDCC is a good point um, uh, where, where like other participants can get involved. Uh, and I think also on some level, there must be some funding for tools like this to have a long-term maintenance because it should not be attached to one specific developer. And if you have some questions about the future of Padata or anything, just get in touch with me. Uh, it's my project I started three years ago, so I'm uh, attached to it a bit. Um, and I'm, I'm still here in Vienna, so, uh, or, or get in touch with GDCC, maybe they can help out. Um, but I think it's uh, good to keep it going. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan. Many thanks. So uh, you are. Uh, we are now in that phase for two questions or two comments. So congratulations to your presentation. Now you that you will have a new phase in your professional life <laughs> that you also highlighted. So feel free to contact him. Uh, so please check the. Um, I think there are no questions, but there are some comments. Maybe you can confirm something related with the credentials that uh, Peter. Uh, uh, re, uh, uh, put the question here in the chat. Um, Philip is highlighting that it will be great to fund Stefan to keep working on PyDataverse. <laughs> and everyone is uh, congratulating you. So Slava, Philip, um, great job uh, that you have done for our community. Many thanks. Um, Okay, really great. So, so at the end of your presentation, you have some relevant people from also our, our community giving you an applause. So thank you. Thank you. If you uh, have any questions, just put in the chat, then Stefan can uh, reply, um, can reply in the, in the, in the chat. Okay, uh, James, so now it's your, your turn. So the Global Dataverse uh, community. So James Myers, large data support globus um let's go we have two more presentations please stay with us so uh, we are having really a great uh, session here so just this presentation and another one i think really really interesting everything so stay with us <laughs> thank you uh, jim yes thanks can you can you hear me and see the slides yes okay. perfect. perfect all right so um I never know where to start with these because I think we've got 
multiple audiences here. There's some people would just like to get the overview of how uh, Dataverse can handle larger data and what, what does larger data mean in terms of Dataverse these days. Um, and other people want some technical details. So you can kind of watch the beginning and the end if you if you want to know about what's here and what's coming soon. And you can uh, dive in in the middle with me for a little bit of technical details of what's going on. Um, a few years ago, I, I think the, the myth, a little bit of a myth was that the Dataverse couldn't handle large data files. And um, even, even when I started with the Dataverse community a few years ago, I think it could handle bigger data than, than uh, was, was understood that files up kind of a gigabyte and above um, can kind of be handled through the traditional upload methods if you set all of the timeouts right and things like that. So the, the first line on my little chart here um, you know, the, the, the way things were 2018, you could get beyond a gigabyte um, if, if you needed to. Um, things that we've added over the last few years, though, are the uh, when you use the S3 protocol, um, and, and again, just uh, one second with S3, right, we talk about it as sort of a type of store, but it really is a protocol. So you can do S3 over your local file system, you can do S3 over Amazon, you can do S3 over StoreJ. Right, it's really the protocol we're talking about, um, and with that protocol, you can do directly uh, up direct upload and downloads, which I'll, I'll explain in a little minute. But essentially, with that, you get ability to do some parallel transfers and files in parts, so you can get much bigger, and you can kind of go up and do. I think I've heard of people in the Dataverse community up to like 300 gigabyte files and beyond. There's there's sort of no limit up into the terabytes, but you know if you're really going to start doing things that big, um, which take hours to move, you might want to start moving up the stack to even bigger tools. And so the newer things, which again, that there have been uh, you know proof of concept demos and things like that that you've seen over the few years. And part of my story today is that those are getting close to actually being in a in a version with with some limitations and things to to actually be uh, usable when you when you get up to the latest versions of Dataverse. Um, but the next level up essentially is uh, using something like Globus, which came out of the high performance computing world um, and is really designed not only to move uh, things in parallel transfer so you can get higher speed, um, but also to do things like move directly from a supercomputer to uh, data storage without going through your desktop machine. So even with S3, you're talking about moving things from a local machine to Dataverse right, right directly to the bucket. but but it's from your local machine, whereas Globus can essentially handle what's called third-party transfers, moving things from a big store to a big store, even though you're sitting using Dataverse on your local machine. Um, and that, that you know, is used in the community to move petabytes of data out in HPC world. I think that the main uh, limitation of the way we've got it in Dataverse right now is that we're still sending that to an S3 bucket and somebody's got to pay for that data um, so if you're going to move this into your library, there's probably a limit as to how big data you want to handle, even with Globus. Um, and sort of the next thing out from there, which again, if you've watched over the last couple of years and things like the, the uh, trusted remote data storage, the idea of never moving the data in the first place and just having Dataverse point to that file. And when people want to download it, sort of redirecting you back to the place you can go get it. Um, you know, that, that in essence has infinite scaling because it's somebody else's file, um, somebody else is paying to store it, and all we're doing is making sure you can reference it and put a DOI on the data set and, and go get the file. Um, and that, again, is, is something that we're, we're mostly thinking of in terms of large data, but in this case, um, that may also be something like with the, the Odom's trusted remote storage. Um, thinking about that for sensitive data, you may want to use that even when the data is very small, if it's it's if it's more sensitive than, than what you want to do here. So um, the, the common theme of kind of moving up the stack from uh, going to Dataverse is sort of get the Dataverse and the server out of the path for upload download um, so that that goes direct. You don't make intermediate copies. Um, leverage the capabilities of these protocols that can do things like parallel transfers, um, uh, do things like uh, restarts and retries and those sorts of things. Um, and then the, the, the way where we sometimes hit limits is sort of where possible we want to integrate because Dataverse does nice things like restriction and now embargoes and things like that where um, Dataverse is trying to control who can get access to that file. And if Dataverse can talk to the remote store like it does with S3, um, it can enforce those access controls so it could actually enforce the embargoes and things. Um, 
where you can't do that, you know, if you're just referencing a data set, for example, that's out on a, on a remote uh, website, um, we want to be able to not, we basically can't control the access because once somebody knows the URL, they can go get it directly and other people who haven't come to Dataverse can go get it. So we want to make sure we're not giving the false impression that you can do restriction and embargo on things that are, that are true, you know, essentially public and you can go around Dataverse and get them anyway. Um, so here's a couple of quick slides with some animations that show you how all this stuff works under the hood. And again, uh, uh, I, I don't have a lot of stuff here, so I'll go quickly. And, and uh, with this, essentially what Direct Uploads S3 do is in, when you're on your browser working with Dataverse, um, the browser goes and asks for signed URLs from Dataverse. Um, they're just URLs of where to go put this data. And the signature is essentially so that the data, Dataverse has keys to the, to the bucket here. It doesn't want to hand the keys to your browser, so it signs URLs that allow you just to upload that file only only do an upload and only for a limited time. Uh, once you get those URLs, the browser pulls it off your disk, sends it in multiple parts to the, to the S3 bucket. And when all those parts are in place, um, it tells Dataverse, yep, the files are in place. Please go up the data, update the data set and show the, the update. So that's essentially what's happening with S3 direct upload. And again, you get parallelization. Um, we can retry these parts from your browser so we get some more robustness than trying to do one shot. And again, you've got no load on the Dataverse server for the main part of the upload. Um, uh, applications like DV Uploader, um, PyDataverse, except we, we haven't gotten Stefan to get time to do the parallel, um, the multi-part uploads for these files yet is not in PyDataverse as far as I understand, and, and that would be a good target for a next thing. But basically these applications are just doing the same thing I just mentioned with the browser, same API, and they, they, they essentially upload from your disk as well. Um, the Globus transfer, which again was started with Scholar's Portal, um, now Borealis a couple of years ago on a 4. something, 4.20 release of Dataverse, uh, sort of improving the concept is a little bit more complex to set up. And that's that's one of the reasons why I sort of, you know, say unless you're trying to get, you know, above the tens of gigabytes, maybe you don't want to um, look at Globus directly. But we add on to, to the basic Dataverse server and a bucket underneath is uh, Globus has a, a premium connector for S3 that essentially talks to your S3 bucket on one side and exposes it as a Globus endpoint on the other side. And then Scholars Portal has written this uh, Globus Transfer app, which right now is getting launched as an external tool. Um, we're looking at how we can put that in and kind of make it look more like the file level upload. So the way this all works, um, again, and, and the part of the fun here is to watch the spaghetti of arrows. Um, when you decide you want to use this, you launch the external tool. Um, the external tool pops up, and I'll show a, a minute and a half demo uh, in here, as long as I don't talk too long, um, that basically shows you how to do this. You select a couple of files, you hit go. Um, once you hit go, um, the, app, the app says, OK, this user is logged into Globus. I will temporarily grant them access to upload files to that data set. Um, it tells the Globus service out there in the cloud at globus.org that the transfer has been requested. Um, Globus talks to your connector and the Globus endpoints out there in the world and says, please start talking to each other and start to transfer. Um, Globus starts up the parallel transfers. And again, not, not only can Globus do things like retry um, these, these things if they fail, but if the Globus service goes down like they're doing maintenance next month, it'll start up two days later when their service comes back up and complete things for you. Um, so since these are you know big terabytes plus, these can take a long time. So the next step in this is for that transfer app to use the API and tell Dataverse server, um, essentially these transfers have started, you take it from here. Um, then the Dataverse server now with some new code that's getting merged in will monitor the Globus service and say, are we done yet? Are we done yet? Are we done yet? And then when it finally is, um, it will go and say, okay, stop that user from uploading anything more. The transfer that's been requested is done, put the, you know, lock down the rights again and, and we're done. Um, and at that point, the Dataverse, you know, if you then refresh, you'll see in the page that the files are there. Um, so quick demo. Um, and again, no sound, so I can talk over it as well. Um, normal data set, I'm going to, uh, the 
demo quickly goes and just shows the normal upload page. And the, the point is to give me two seconds to say, essentially, we'd like to see if we can get that external tool to just kind of show up as a frame um, down here in this as normal so that it looks like the same sort of thing. But for now, um, you go out and click uh, the, into the external tools menu. You start up the tool. Um, if you have in Globus, you can have personal endpoints. In my case, I just went out and found a public endpoint that seems to have some biology data. Um, I know little bits about biology, but that's about it. So I was just picking random files. Um, you can go double click, um, right? The, the tool is talking to the Globus service and letting you go all the way down through the files and uh, folder directories and whatnot. Select it all, select the ones you want, hit submit transfer. Um, this tool will say it's it's preparing the transfer, the transfer is going. Now go back to Dataverse and go take a look. And if you do, um, Dataverse will then uh, basically give you the normal, there's an edit in progress, you have to wait. Um, and I'm just gonna slide the bar over here because right now um, uh, this is set up for large transfer. So it's really only asking Globus, are we done yet like once a minute or something? So it's not until we get over to the 200, you know, two minutes and 40 second mark here that that last monitor is done. Um, please, you know, remove the lock and show the data sets in here. And so now here's our two new files. Um, again, the, the, the transfer was because these were only 40 gigabyte files. The delay was a long time just because we're expecting this to take hours. And so we're only checking once a minute. Um, the last little two seconds in the video are just showing that although this is now accessible by Globus as well, these are also just files in the S3 bucket. So the last thing that happened there was a download, right? They're just like the two local files they had in that same data set. All right, so with that, um, oops, I went backwards instead of forward, sorry. Um, oh, oh, Wait, last thing. All right, so I'm getting close to end, right? I have what, a minute less? Yes, 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 it's okay. Okay, um, so the, the last thing is remote storage. And again, the, the trick here is that the upload is really easy. We're just telling the uh, Dataverse through a new API uh, extension that it's at some low, some remote place. And when your browser goes and asks to, to download it, um, it just like with S3 says, well, browser, go to the other place instead. So if that's just a file, you can go out and go get it. Um, we can sign those URLs. So if that thing understands signatures, it can deny access unless you actually have a good valid signed URL, which Dataverse will only get you if you should have gotten to the file so we can enforce restrictions and embargoes. Um, you can also, in the, in a case like uh, TRSA, where you go to might not actually be the file download, but it might be a separate page that says, okay, you've now got to, you know, go sign this user agreement. You've got to go and, you know, show your credentials, show your driver's license, or you've got to come on campus to get the file, whatever. Um, so you can really have some sophisticated tools on that side that might do things that are very interesting. So um, if you're back on Dataverse 4.x, you should get to the, you know, get up here to 5.10, 5.11. Um, direct upload exists. Anything you do with S3 like that, all that stuff is is in there and and works uh, fairly well these days. Um, Globus again, Scholars Portal had it working under 4.x kind of proof of concept uh, through the Harvard Data Commons, um, which you'll hear about in other parts of the the, the week. Um, it's it's uh, Harvard Data Commons is helping to bring this up. So we've got a working branch that's based off of 5.11. Um, we're going to have Globus working um, for public data essentially turning off access and embargo that we hope to get in the next release. So, um, you know, hand wavy, that's 512, um, but sometime this summer, uh, same thing, the remote store, you've heard about it from TRSA for a long time. We're basically at the point where Harvard Data Commons is kind of pushing it across the, the bar. So we're gonna have that stuff working kind of in the next version. And again, both of these will probably say experimental because they'll change a little bit after that. Um, so again, just pointing out that these are right, multiple people in the community are funding parts of this and have done the work to get us to this far over time. Um, so uh, thanks to all of them. And that's it. Thank you. Many thanks, Jim. So if you have any question, please um, ask put it in the chat, any comment that Jen can, Jen can address. Uh, so one question from Jose Carvalho. From... Yep. We'll, so we'll rob us. Yes. You can read it. Yeah. Yes. So the 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 way we're using Globus right now is essentially making Globus 
um, right, is its own protocol. And so Globus has this connector that you set up and really all Globus is doing is writing into a normal bucket. So in theory, you could set up the Globus connector to talk to an S3 store that is StoreJ or Amazon or whatever underneath. Um, it, the other way to look at this is that StoreJ actually is doing its own kind of S3 gateway. It has a native protocol that's much more efficient than going through the S3 gateway. So we might at some point want to talk about uh, a sort of a native uh, StoreJ interaction to, to let you do uploads or something like that instead. So um, you can put them together. Um, uh, and that, and that, that again, may, may be some, some good way to do that with those, uh, those kinds of connectors. Okay, thank you, Tim. So Hannah is already sharing the screen. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for waiting. Now the last and presentation. More questions? Yeah, you can just, I just wanted to, to yes, set the let's, stage. Let's go to Anna. Uh, that is a slow one post, postdoctoral fellow at uh, IQSS. So she have uh, she have a, a research focus on reproducibility, data provenance, open science. So this is a very good reason to stay with us for the next uh, 14, 13 minutes. Okay, Anna. Yeah. People is is ready to listen to you. So let's go. Last presentation. Thank you all yeah, for staying here. Mm -hmm. um, the best for the last. <laughs> Uh, so yes, my name is Anna, and I'm um, I'm a research associate uh, also at uh, Harvard Biostatistics, but also at IQSS. And I'm going to talk about uh, dataverse integration with GitHub via a GitHub action. So what we've seen in this session is that uh, Dataverse has many integrations with different tools and platforms um, online. And uh, all of these kind of like uh, have their own strengths. And by integrating Dataverse with these different platforms, uh, we are uh, allowing higher uh, uh, higher usability for, for the everything that is deposited on Dataverse. So on Dataverse, we have research data and code, but then um, when we share the metadata to data site, they are more findable or uh, more re-executable um, when, when we share them on uh, Holtail and Binder. And of course, there are other tools such as um, uh, Dropbox and Globus that Dataverse integrates with. But here I'm going to talk about uh, GitHub. So I'm going to talk about uh, the software repository GitHub, and that's where the software development happens. And that is relevant for us because it also it is also where research software development happens. And in Dataverse, we want to, of course, capture uh, this research software. So the idea is that uh, research software or code or uh, research data that is in GitHub, we want it to be shared on Dataverse where it would be more fair. So more documented in metadata. And also this is particularly relevant for publications. For example, we want to keep a particular snapshot, software snapshot related to a published paper for reproducibility. So how we implement this is with uh, GitHub Actions. So what, the, what are GitHub Actions? How do they work? So GitHub Actions, uh, it is a continuous integration and continuous delivery platform. So it automates build, test, and deployment pipeline. So in this case, the de deployment pipeline to um, upload to Dataverse. It is a composite workflow that can be used and reused in multiple GitHub repositories. So how our uh, Dataverse GitHub action looks like. So GitHub Actions also have their own marketplace that you can access. And this is um, a screenshot from the GitHub Marketplace. And this is where the Dataverse Uploader action uh, sits. So now you might ask, OK, it's nice that we have this um, Dataverse Uploader action, but how do we use the action? So OK, uh, in order to use the action, we need to have uh, few things, so few re a few prerequisites. So first, we need to create a Dataverse deposit. So we need to uh, go to our uh, Dataverse installation and create a new data set that will have a unique DOI. The next thing is that uh, we uh, have our own 
GitHub repository. So this is how uh, GitHub repository view looks like. And in order to connect these two, we will create a new folder that is this .github uh, folder that has uh, GitHub settings. And in this folder, we will place um, a new text file that will specify that we want to use the action. And that is this action, IQSS Dataverse Uploader. So what then happens is that in this uh, action, we also say that every time we push to this repository, uh, we want this uh, we want this data set or this repository, GitHub repository, to be uploaded to Dataverse. And then once that is done, we will get this uh, green checkbox and we will know that the process completed successfully. All right. So now let's see what are these other things in the, in the action text file. So first I mentioned that uh, there are some uh, GitHub events that can trigger the action. So that can uh, start the action. So in this case, we use a push. Uh, so every time we have a new uh, commit, uh, push, push commit to the repository. But there is also, for example, this uh, workload dispatch, which is a manual way to upload to to start the action. Next, uh, okay, so here we specify that we want to use um, the GitHub action, so Dataverse uploader, but then uh, the things that we need and that they're required, so required arguments are the Dataverse token, Dataverse server, and the dataset DOI. So the Dataverse token is something that we can very easily get from any Dataverse instance. Uh, the Dataverse instance is essentially or a server. It's a URL of the, of the instance we want to upload to. And that is, uh, so there are um, over 70 installations of Dataverse worldwide. So we want to, uh, to use the one that is more relevant to us. And then we uh, need to know the DOI of the data set we want to update. All right, so these are the required arguments. Next, we have optional arguments. So the first one is uh, GitHub uh, DIR. So we can uh, here upload, choose to upload either the whole repository or just a sub, sub directory of the repository. So for example, in this case, I'm just uploading some slides. Um, but yeah, if we have this, um, we also can choose not to have this optional argument. And then in that case, we will upload the whole repository. Next, we have this uh, delete argument. So we can use it if we want to sync up or, uh, uh, or totally replace um, the, the data set. Or if it is false, then we would the data set on Dataverse would be appended with a new, so new files would be added, but it would not be deleted. Uh, so it would not be completely synced up or replaced. And then finally, we have this uh, publish option. So in that case, we can choose whether we want the data set to be a draft. So if the publish is false, or we want to publish a new version of a data set on Dataverse. And that happens if uh, publish, the publish argument is true. All right, so in summary, we have uh, three mandatory arguments. So uh, token server and Dataverse DOI. And then we also have some optional arguments. So Dataverse, uh, so like a folder you want to upload, whether we want to completely sync the data set or publish it or not. So this GitHub action is already at this point highly customizable. All right. So how, how did we implement the GitHub action? So implementation, just a few words on implementation. So we learned uh, just at this session about uh, PyDataverse, the um, client. And this action actually uses PyDataverse to communicate with the target Dataverse installation. It also uses uh, other APIs, but for some of it, it uses PyDataverse. And then by default, it uploads the whole GitHub repository to the Dataverse dataset. 
it replaces so deletes file in the dataverse dataset to avoid duplication and uploads the updated content also it does not publish the updated dataset by default but keeps it as a draft in dataverse and then one can navigate to the browser to publish um, the dataset all right so what are the other features uh, the action, so the GitHub action, also preserves the repository structure. So here you can see uh, just some temporary folders that I created. But if there are temporary folders in GitHub, this, uh, these folders will be preserved. OK. And then also, um, the action also adds some metadata to the files. So for example, uh, it adds that the origin a repository so in this case so uploaded with the action from a specific repository but of course this is something that can be also uh, also advanced right to, to add more data metadata all right last i would like to mention a few references and related projects so um the github action and the integration with github has made it to the official uh, dataverse documentation so here uh, at, in the official guides at guidesdataverse.org, there is some information about the GitHub action. Um, the action is um, developed, created at uh, on GitHub, of course, and there is a repository. So you can uh, check it out or also add your comments and submit issues or pull requests. And last, I would like to also mention another project that is also fits within the theme of integration with GitHub, and that is the Dataverse Badge Maker. So it's a small uh, web page where we can create um, small uh, badges. So for the different DOIs um, and link in that way to our data sets. So these badges can be added to the readme markdown files in um, GitHub. Uh, all right, so we have a full minute for the questions. Um, that was it. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, great work, uh, Anna. Many thanks for your presentations, for sharing this uh, really relevant uh, work. So there is a question, I think. Can you check in the chat? Uh, or... I think it, uh, Jeremy is asking if this can work with handles instead of the OIs. I think um, depends. Do they do they behave the same in the API? If they do, then yes. If they don't, then no. Essentially, we in this project we reuse we try to reuse um, PyDataverse um, as the kind of like as a as an updated project, right? And then also the API. So in case. The, the Dataverse API itself handles these hand, uh, ha handles, then it will work the same. Yeah, Philip is confirming that they work in the same way. There is also a, a, another call, another question from our colleague from Hugh Levine. Do you want to read it or should I read it? So all unchanged files are also deleted and re-uploaded. Won't that give an incorrect version record? Um, for some files, yes. But then the thing is that um, every time there is a new file to the Dataverse dataset, that's considered to be a major change and the major and the new release is required. So for example, if a dataset was um, release uh, version one, then it will need version two if a single file is changed. So, um, so when, all files are deleted and re-uploaded. Uh, I mean, even what I'm trying to say, even if there is like a change with a single file, the new version will ne need to be created. So yeah, so kind of like it is, I think more or less than the same because we will, the files will be, will be, yeah, recreated. But then if even a single file was changed, it, we could not kind of like avoid it that the new version is created. Yes. So does Peter it also ask, does it fetch metadata and stores into the metadata of the data set, such as contributors name from GitHub? Um, yeah, so the thing is, because the data set needs to be created first, 
the empty data set. This uh, citation metadata, it is already uh, already existing in the in the dataverse data set. So this information, who the authors are, what is the name of the data set, that already needs to be present. But then when uploads the single files, the action then can change uh, metadata for each of the single files. So in this case, that is uh, something that, um, yeah, that is implemented right now, that um, the, just the action modifies the metadata for single files, but not for the whole data set. But then that is also something that can be, that can be explored further and also uh, added to. So for example, there is um, some citation, citation file format that is now incorporated in GitHub. And this action can, for example, uh, parse this uh, citation file format files and then also update and modify the database uh, metadata. So I think that could be uh, helpful. Yes, I think we, we covered the questions. In the versioning tab, you can see which files have been changed. Ah, okay, it's a comment for the previous. Okay, okay I think I think we can uh, we can close. Many thanks, Anna. Let's let's keep the the chat open for uh, one uh, two or three minutes for you to um, to reply to questions or to ask questions. Uh, thank you for all the speakers. This is clearly a session where the community show that is our our. That is really strong. <laughs> so the Dataverse community. Many thanks for the the, the panelists, the speakers. Um, we will have a, a second session of this integrations into um, session uh, on Thursday. So many thanks for all the speakers and for your participation. So 